Happy Friday, everyone. I'm back. It's Flamingo Friday. We're going to be talking about two amazing stocks, applied materials first, and then we'll be discussing air test systems and their most recent quarter's earnings results and our take on this hot stock right now. Let's jump right into it. Let's start with applied materials and their news in the recent weeks. Hey, Casey. Yes, applied materials had a pair of announcements here in the last couple of weeks. They announced first a slew of new processes and equipment types, specifically aimed at what is known as heterogeneous integration, or simply HI. Oftentimes, we'll hear these things referred to as chiplets. So basically, lots of little Lego pieces, disparate types of chips and different technology, all packaged together. And this is a departure from the traditional system, which is called monolithic semiconductor architecture. Basically, that's a single piece of silicon that makes up the entire integrated circuit. So a lot of new stuff happening here with 2.5D, that's basically two or more chips side by side packaged together on the same substrate, or 3D architecture where it's two or more chips stacked on top of each other. Can you explain a little bit more about where this new equipment fits into the semiconductor making process and why exactly this is a big deal? You mentioned the word heterogeneous. What exactly does that mean? when it comes to chip making? And why is that a big deal for applied materials and some of the other semiconductor companies that it supplies materials to? We can just say HI, right? We don't need to try to spit out heterogeneous or is it heterogeneous? I'm not exactly sure, but I will be very happy to just say HI. It seems much simpler and I don't sound like a fool. Okay, me neither. Let's just go with that and we'll ask our AI overlords later, how to pronounce that properly. This slide that you referred to, Casey, it's nice that Applied put this together so they can show specifically all the machines that they make that address these specific steps in the chip making process. You can see all the machines they have already and specifically which ones they announced that are brand new or an update on an existing piece of machinery. So first is hybrid bonding. So that's essentially when you need to make some sort of interconnect between two chips. So that's what you see there on top, hybrid bonding flow. Perhaps this is like a 2.5D architecture where you have multiple chips sitting side by side, and you need to somehow connect those chips together. And then below that, through silicon vias, this is maybe like a 3D architecture where you have chips stacked on top of each other. And so you basically need some sort of electrical flow going through that three-dimensional stack of chips. This is packaging. If we go to the slide that we've referred to many times that talks about wafer fabrication, the many dozens, if not hundreds of steps in actually manufacturing the wafer, this stuff is actually at the very tail end of the process, or sometimes it's even after the wafer has been chopped up into actual chips and it's starting to get packaged together on on some sort of substrate. We're talking about basically packaging here, either wafer level packaging or actual chip packaging after the wafer has been chopped up. These new pieces of equipment that Applied Materials has really have released, it really underscores the fact that chips are getting progressively more complex. The annual sales of chips is just going to continue climbing We have a statistic here that the sales are expected to reach $1 trillion by the end of this decade, which would be a nearly 70% increase from 2022. The more complex chips that are being made, the more semiconductor companies are going to rely on more efficient machines to make them. And that leads us to another new development that Applied Materials released on a piece of equipment called Vistara. Nick, can you tell us a little bit more about that piece of equipment and what problems that will solve in the semiconductor industry? The star. Casey, I think this one is maybe even perhaps more significant. Basically, Vistara is an updated version of Applied Materials wafer manufacturing platform. This is what they say the biggest update they've made in a decade. 
And we have some pictures here of what this thing looks like. There's basically three main components to this. So first, flexibility with chamber types, sizes, and combinations. So those chambers are the tall white parts of the machine platform that you see here in the picture. And you can, a customer could actually customize this to have as few as four chambers or up to 12 chambers. And these can be swapped out in different configurations. Basically what these chambers are is you have these many dozens of different steps in manufacturing the wafer itself. And so you can configure Vistara with the different steps based on what it is you need to accomplish. What's the type of chip that you need to make? What's the end use of the chip? What problem are you trying to solve? That's going to dictate how you actually manufacture the chip. And so the actual chambers that are attached to this thing are fully customizable because of this. It actually has a much smaller footprint, up to 30% smaller than the previous generation platform that Applied Materials makes. And this thing is also customizable with other chip manufacturers' equipment too. So a company that uses this isn't necessarily locked into Applied Materials chambers or specific equipment. Flexibility. Also intelligence. This thing can be outfit with thousands of different sensors. And all of those sensors feed into Applied Materials AI software. So remember, Applied, like many other equipment makers, have this service component. Roughly 20% of revenue comes from this service component. Software as a service and related services. And this is designed to help with the monitoring, to increase energy efficiency of the system, to increase yield, basically getting more chips per wafer. All things that are top of mind for a semiconductor manufacturer these days, they all need to get more efficient in their earnings to keep shareholders happy, but also they all have environmental impact goals as well. So the Vistara can help with that, which leads into the third point, sustainability. Again, the company says this thing uses up to a third less energy, a third less materials, the raw materials, like let's say gases water usage and such. Even the footprint itself being a third less when a company is building a new fab. If you have a smaller footprint, that means less concrete, less rebar, less roof space over the piece of equipment. So you can see the cascading effect here of beginning to use a new platform like this, where you get perhaps more complicated chip manufacturing capabilities, better yield, and more cost savings. Pretty cool stuff. Speaking of chip fabs, Nick, let's talk about how much money is actually going into chip fabs in the coming years. Industry Association, Semi.org, predicted $500 billion will be invested in new global chip fab construction by 2024. And of course, a lot of that funding is coming from local governments, isn't it? We've talked about this before in episodes the U.S. Chips Act, now there's a European version of that. All of these countries are funneling a lot of money into these chip fabs. So what exactly does this mean for applied materials? Yeah, Casey, it's really hard to gauge what this number will ultimately be. But yes, Semi.org said $500 billion by 2024. Dozens of new fabs, not to mention existing fabs getting outfitted with new equipment as well. Basically, this is a new record being set here, quite unprecedented. And like you mentioned, all of these governments, the US, Europe, South Korea, Japan, China, India, we talked about India a few weeks ago as well, right? All of a sudden, it, it wants a piece of the chip fab pie. We don't know how big this is going to be, but it's hundreds of billions of dollars. And all of those new fabs need to be filled with new equipment. Like you mentioned already, the $1 trillion in total chip cells in by the end of this decade, roughly 70% higher than where it's at right now, 7 to 8% Kager in each year between now and then basically is what we're looking at and more complex chips. This is a coming a tidal wave of revenue for a company like Applied Materials. Now, I think everybody knows at this point that the company is more or less, let's say, flatlined this year. They're not putting up much in the way of revenue growth or earnings growth. Some of their more advanced equipment has taken a step back. 
as companies like TSMC and Intel and Samsung retool for the next gen high performance chips. But then other areas of the market like automotive, like epitaxy tools, Applied Materials and Excellus compete in tools like this aimed at the automotive market, silicon carbide, which we'll talk more about here in a moment, pulling the weight and keeping applied materials even with the previous peak. I think we basically think the market is hyper-focused on what will happen in the next, let's say, six, nine, 12 months, and really overlooking this tidal wave of revenue that is, we think, impending for 2024, 2025, and 2026. That's a good segue into the financials of this company, Applied Materials, and whether or not it's time to invest, it's time to wait, or time to sell. So let's talk about that now. We'll show you a chart from Ticker Terminal over the year-to-date performance of Applied Materials. You can see that it's up over 40%. Nick, can you tell us what you think about the current valuation of this stock and what a fair price value is? Yeah, and I think we're going to reverse engineer this and look at, based on the current price, what is the market baking into the valuation right now, rather than just what we think a fair value is. If you're keeping score with this part of our process, that's how we approach this. Because clearly, like you're showing here, Casey, the market expects something more than 40% performance year to date applied not too far off of its all-time high. So the market is clearly pricing in something. In spite of that, shares currently trade for just over 20 times trailing 12-month earnings and just shy of 19 times next year's expected earnings. This is where we think there's opportunity because what the market is thinking is applied materials earnings are flatlining this year, and the market currently has this estimate that they're more or less going to flatline or maybe be up about 5% next year as well. And I think this is where we think things are a bit conservative. So here's the reverse engineering of the expectations on and the current valuation. So to get to the current price of roughly 145 bucks per share, give or take a couple of bucks, we're using a blended earnings per share and free cash flow per share of $7.20 over the last trailing 12-month period. We're going to factor for 20% growth in earnings per share and free cash flow per share for the next two years, and then just 5% per share earnings growth thereafter. We're using a 10% discount rate and using that discounted cash flow model, the fair value of applied materials is $195 per share. So I'm playing roughly a more than 35%, but if you think that is a reasonable expectation, 20% per share earnings growth for two years, and then just 5% thereafter. If that's all you expect, I think for the record, for you and I, our internal estimate is much higher than that over, especially the next three years. But if all that's, if that's all you're expecting, we think applied materials is pretty good value right here. Great dividend stock. The company repurchases lots of shares in addition to the dividend. And that is still plenty of cash left over for them to invest in research and development, the occasional tuck and acquisition. This is why we have said multiple times over the course of the last year now, Casey, this channel has been live. Applied Materials is one of our favorites. That being said, we're more than happy to be patient with this one. So please bear that in mind. We are very patient investors. We are not looking for immediate, instantaneous upside from our investments. But we think over the next three years, Applied Materials has great potential. This is why we keep mentioning this chart right here, the semiconductor industry flow chart, because we truly believe that the equipment part of the semiconductor process is a very large choke point in the industry. It's a very vital part of the industry. So if you also consider that to be the case, you may find that Applied Materials is a stock that you want to buy and hold for the long term. Yeah, chip fabs, they are the way of the future, or at least the next three to five years. Okay, time to move on to air test systems. They recently reported their Q4 fiscal year 2023 earnings report. 
people have been ravenous over this small cap stock. And I don't know if there's any better way to put it. So let's talk about it. Let's try to be reasonable, objective investors when looking at this stock and looking at it for the long term. Let's dive into some of the numbers here. Their most recent quarter revenue, $22.3 million, gross margin of 50%, operating margin a little over 24%. Their net income was a record at $6.1 million, which was up from $5.8 million last year. This company has about $48 million in cash and short-term investments, no debt, and to top it all off, they expect a 50% year-over-year revenue growth for fiscal 2024. So all of this sounds fantastic, but let's talk about the nitty-gritty, Nick. Why don't you kick us off diving a little bit beneath the surface here? Yeah, maybe we should mention this fourth quarter of their fiscal year was very good. The outlook was even better. Like you said, they said at least 50% year over year growth. We don't think they're sandbagging. We've received a number of questions about that. Do we think they're sandbagging? I would say no. Just remember in their just wrapped up fiscal year, they actually had said that they expected revenue to be up as much as 35, 37%. And they didn't come anywhere close to that. It's a tough year. Don't read more into it than you need to right now. Let management provide the guidance. I don't think there's a lot of purpose to be served in trying to like pencil in even higher numbers than what management has already told us. But at least 50% revenue growth, which is going to translate into at least 90% growth in net income and in earnings per share on a gap basis. So this is fantastic, Casey. And of course, everyone who's aware of air test systems knows that this is being driven by the silicon carbide market up to this point, specifically the electric vehicle market and now a bunch of other things. So they, their leading customer up to this point has been on Semiconductor, one of our favorites here. They announced a new customer, an industrial power chip customer that wants their equipment to test and burn in silicon carbide. It's probably Mitsubishi. And we know that because this company supposedly is working on inverters for trains. So there's a good chance it's probably Mitsubishi. Air Test System said they have another customer that placed some orders that they're going to use for silicon photonics. Basically, like we were talking about with applied materials, that heterogeneous integration, HI, chiplets, trying to figure out how to package these things in new ways to increase the performance of semiconductors. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they're probably talking about Intel here, but whatever. At the end of the day, all of these announcements that were made, I, I don't think this is new information. CEO Gain Erickson has been at the helm since 2012. Air Test Systems has had to be very patient and they're now in command of the spotlight here and they're making hay. So this was a very good report, but I think we should maybe just cool down a little bit here and realize that this is not new stuff that's going on. The company has been working on this now for over a decade and fruit of that labor is now coming to fruition, but I don't think there's a lot of point in trying to read more into it than what Ericsson and the top team have already provided us. There are two other items that we found pretty significant from the earnings call. The first one is the 10K form. That has not been filed yet. And when asked about it, management said that the filing is proposed August 28th. So that's a little over a month from now. We will not have that 10K form. Therefore, we don't know anything about their free cash flow and some other financials in that form. The second thing that we found interesting, their customers that make up over 10% of the revenue. They were asked specifically about this. How many customers make up that? Management answered that they have two customers over 10%. One is at 79% of revenues and the other is 10% of revenues. And actually there is even one more thing just as a follow-up question to that answer. When, when talking about the revenue guidance for next year, how many 10% customers are you assuming in that guidance? CEO Gain Erickson said he didn't want to get too specific on it, but he said he thinks that maybe three or four. They will obviously be heavily focused on the big silicon carbide customers this last year, fiscal tw year 2023. 
he continues, we expect while they will continue to be a great customer and certainly a 10% customer for years to come, that there will be less of a focus in terms of concentration on them. So Nick, maybe you can add a little bit of flavor to these comments made. Okay. Yeah. So maybe that last thing you said, again, that's on semiconductor. That's the big giant customer. They have been very aggressive in, in ramping up their silicon carbide production at scale and doing so highly at a highly profitable scale as well. Check out our last video on that. I had a chance to talk with the CFO, Thad Trent, about that. They have a fantastic business model addressing the silicon carbide market, including buying these things from air test systems. So, you know, that's actually a good thing. You know, you don't want one customer making up 80% of your revenue. So adding new customers into the mix, be it Mitsubishi, Intel, maybe it's Rome, Semiconductor, ST Micro, who knows, they're engaged with a lot of companies that want to get into silicon carbide. That's all good for air test systems. So that's positive for shareholders that are looking at that customer concentration as a major risk. Your first point on the free cash flow, I think that's also notable as well, because I know a lot of you viewers have already taken a sizable position in this company or would like to take a sizable position in this company. And if you have not read an annual report yet, this is something that we do with every single company before we make even a small investment. It's really important. So when that 10K comes out in August, make sure you take the time. It's not the most interesting reading, but you're going to learn a lot about the business. And you're probably going to have some things about the business model revealed to you for the first time that you do not see on YouTube or that you do not see in written articles on the internet from analysis about companies. Do your own due diligence. Please read the 10K. Even if you use the control F function and search through like key terms that you're looking for, at the very least, maybe do that and just learn some things about this business, the positives and the negatives. I think this is probably a good spot to mention once again, our approach on small cap investing. We did just a very brief short on this recently, but it's actually merits some consideration here because when investing in a small cap stock, the basket approach is actually what you want because you want a wide ranging group that may take off, not just one or two of these stocks that you're sinking your portfolio into, hoping that you're going to hit it rich. It could happen. It's possible. But the more probable of outcomes is that you lose on those bets. Yeah, Casey, I think one of the most common requests that we get is do more small cap stock coverage. And I think there's still this perception that small cap business, tiny business equals greater investment return. And like you just said, it might equate to greater investment return than a large business, than a mega cap. But truthfully, most of the time, no. If you invest in, let's say, two dozen small cap stocks, most of them are probably going to underperform the market over the course of a 10-year stretch. And maybe just one or two of them soars and offsets all of the turds that you invest in <laughs> along with it. We are not among the world's best small cap stock investors. We're not. We uncover lots of them that we like and we nibble here or there. But what I do know is from talking with people that are very good small cap investors is they all take this basket approach. They're buying dozens of small cap stocks. And so maybe air test system might be one of those stocks that you put in your basket of small caps. But by and large, most investors should not be betting the farm on a company like this. Okay, then let's talk about valuation. Let's talk about value. Casey, rattle off the valuation. Maybe get us started here. I need a break. I need a breath. Yeah, you went on a tangent there for a second. I'll just tell everyone what the valuation is currently. So right now, at this moment, stock trades for 86 times trailing 12-month earnings per share. Management guided for 90%. But if earnings per share double in fiscal year 2024, that's a 100% increase. So the stock is still trading on those expected earnings for over 40 times earnings per share. 
if the earnings per share double again in 2025, that would still mean that it's trading for over 20 times fiscal year 2025 earnings per share. Yeah, suffice to say that would be an absolutely epic run, right, Casey? For two years in a row, doubling earnings per share. It could most certainly happen, absolutely, if this wave of new silicon carbide customers is coming online and air test systems lands all of them yeah maybe maybe we're we'll, we're looking at two dollars in earnings per share for fiscal year 2025 and that would put the stock at roughly 21 times fiscal year 2025 earnings that sounds almost too good to be true and that is a ridiculously high valuation for this type of company isn't it if we look at our semiconductor equipment index. Is there anything that's trading at this high of a valuation? No. Air Test Systems stands in a league unto its own right at the moment. And it's a tiny, small cap stock. I think this is where we start to get really skeptical. We owned Air Test Systems. It's ironic to me that everyone wants to talk about it now. I published a couple of articles on this thing last summer, and then we initially bought at 16 bucks per share. Bought again in the 20s. I think our first video that we did on it was in October, and it was still right around 21, 22 bucks a share at that time. And we recently sold the last of our position at like over 42 bucks per share. We more than doubled our money in less than six months. And this is not normal. I think oh, some of our viewers have maybe been around watching things I've written and video appearances for years during the software as a service, cloud computing craze. And I talked a lot about when companies in the software space began to scale from negative profitability to robust profitability for the first time. You can get some really dramatic results, not just financial results. But of course, that would trickle down into the stock. And that's what's happening here with Air. But Air Test Systems is not a software business. And that's really significant. I think a lot of investors are still in this mindset where you have like infinite scalability. I even see some calls online for this company as being like a recurring service play because of the wafer packs that get sold on a recurring basis. But I think that's a bit of a misnomer because yes, it is a recurring sale, but it's more of a consumable sale because it's still a piece of hardware. It needs to be manufactured. You don't get the infinite scalability like you do with software. And so you're not going to get these long extended runs of massive per share earnings increases for many years all in a row. And this is, of course, not even mentioning the fact that semiconductor equipment is cyclical. Like we were just talking about with applied materials, we think the next three years are incredibly promising, but then 2026, maybe 2025, 2026, 2027, are we going to have a cyclical downturn again as fabs kind of pause and retool again for another new generation of semiconductor manufacturing? You have to account for those. So I think this is where we really get skeptical and take pause here with a company like Air Test Systems and is why we did what is not normal for us and sold after a very short period of time. Ideally, we like to buy and hold for many years or the indefinite future. At what fair value would you find this stock and how far out do we need to look for it to be currently fair valued? I'm curious. What are your thoughts on that? Super simple, using discounted cash flow to reverse engineer what the market is pricing in at this point. Same process as we use with applied materials. What you said before, earnings per share doubling in fiscal year 2024, the new fiscal year that just started, and then doubling again in fiscal year 2025, and then about 6% growth, average annual growth thereafter, gives us a fair value of about $46 per share. That's the fair value. So we're there. If that's your expectation, the earnings are going to double twice, once this year and the new year, and then again next year, and then continue to grow at a mid to high single digit rate thereafter, the stock is already fair valued. If you bump things up to high single digit growth after these next two years, maybe even approaching 10% average annual growth after doubling for the next two years. Air test systems is wildly undervalued for the long term. Right now, air test systems is making some unique equipment, but it's not like there's not a single other chip 
equipment manufacturing company that could develop very similar equipment. We have companies like Advantest or Teradyne that very readily could develop a test or burn-in system that can handle multiple wafers at the same time. There is some competition there. Even smaller companies you mentioned like Pintamaster or EDA Industries, probe car companies like Form Factor, which we've covered. All of these companies maybe don't yet make the exact equipment that Air Test Systems does, but you can bet that they're working on it. Yeah, this is a fantastic point. Gain Erickson said their expectation is the silicon carbide test and burn-in market is worth $400 million per year within the next five years. Someone's paying attention to that other than Air Test Systems. These other competitors aren't just going to allow Air Test to scoop up that entire piece of the pie. So I think that's a great point. And I think that needs to be factored into your fair value estimate of a company like this. Don't just expect this thing to go to the moon with zero gravity holding it, trying to hold it back. I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you had to choose one stock, applied materials or air test systems, which would you add to your portfolio, keep in your portfolio or add to your portfolio? So this is not to say we are bearish on air test systems as a business. We think this is a great business. It has great promise, which is why we invested in it in the first place last year. But the stock valuation is very problematic. This is not a infinitely scalable software business. This is not the next Amazon. This is not the next whatever, take your pick, NVIDIA. And so you have to contend with at this point your own psychology. If you're buying a stock right now, our psychology, our internal wiring as human beings is we like to see that stock price go up right now, instantly. And if you buy a company like Air Test Systems right now at such a sky high valuation, maybe you make a ton of money over the next 10 years. But what about the next two to three years? We think there is a tremendous amount of growth already built into the current valuation. Versus applied materials, we think the market is starting to get wind of the upcoming growth boom for the company, perhaps next year and into 2025. But the valuation still looks very reasonable. I'm not saying this company is going to put up 50% growth like Air Test Systems is. However, with a very reasonable valuation and an upcoming wave of growth, maybe 20% earnings growth on average for a couple of years, we think there's actually better chance of making money and applied materials over the next two to three years now. And so that's what we're adding. And we're on pause with air test systems. Just a reminder to hit the subscribe button. Don't miss a video. And if you haven't watched it yet, Nick had a very interesting discussion with the VP of automotive at NVIDIA. Mr. Danny Shapiro was very gracious in allowing us to talk with him about the automotive industry and how AI is shaping that industry. So if you have not watched that video yet, you can learn a lot from this interview and the semiconductor and AI industry as a whole. Next week, we're gonna take a look at some mining companies. So make sure you tune in for that. And that's it.